By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome to the very first episode of the Wizards Cup. This was a tournament held right here on Timmy Talks and the upcoming Tuesdays will be dedicated to this unique tournament. Every wizard that was part of this was challenged to build a deck with three sets, Fallen Empires, Homelands, and the Dark. So they could only choose cards from those three sets, uh, with the exception of basic lands, of course. You do need some basics, although my opponent today <laughs> seems to think otherwise. Now, if you wanna know more about this format, check the description below. There you will find a link to the tournament website with all the ins and outs, the restricted lists, pictures of all the decks, and also a spoiler alert here, you can see the results. So if you don't wanna see the results, simply don't visit the tab that says results, right? It's not like when you go on the tournament website that you will see, this is the winner, this is the runner up. No, you will just see all the deck pictures. Um, but if you wanna see the specific results, you can do so as well. But don't do it yet. It's way more fun to follow the tournament right here on Timmy Talks. So today I'm playing against a player called Turn One Sengir, and he's uh, built a five colored deck that I've called the Homelands Tour. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. I'm playing uh, with uh, Journey to the Wizard School. It's a mono blue deck I built. Now, before I go to the deck decks, I have beautiful deck pictures of both of these decks. As always, you can also skip this section and go straight to the action itself. How can you do that? Simple, check the description below. There you will find a timestamp marked MTG Games. Click on there, that will take you straight to the action. And here we are going to start with the deck deck. And the first deck that I'm gonna look at is the deck from Turn One Sangir, Homelands Tour. And here we see the deck of Turn One Sangir. And this is, wow, this is such a special deck. Uh, it's called the Homelands Tour. As you can see, it's five colored. There are no basic lands in this deck. This deck is just, it's just insane. It's beautiful and it's it's kind of crazy at the same time. Um, the nice thing is about Homelands is what they've done, they came out with special uh, lands. So special Homelands lands. And each land refers to a region in the Homelands and in the story of Homelands. So you've got Anhava Township, you've got Ace and Abbey, you've got Castle Sengir, you've got Cuscan Keep, and you've got the Wizard School, right? And then you've got the whole of Homelands. Well, that's all represented in this deck, you can see there are two of each. And when you're playing with five colors, because kind of let's let's have a look at these lands, right? So you you may think, okay, they're actually not that bad because with one land, I can make three different colors. That is true, but look how much you have to pay. So they come into play untapped, right? At least that's something. You can tap them for one colorless mana, and then each of them has one like key color. So for example, Unhave Township, has pay one and tap and you get a green mana. So their key color is green, but they also have two other colors. And that's kind of where the lands get, in my eyes at least, problematic, because you've got to pay two and tap to make one white mana or two and tap and one red mana. So just paying two mana just to get one colored mana back, it is just too steep. Even in this format, even when you play Fallen Empire's Homelands Dark only, which is kind of a, a crazy combination, right? Even then, this is too steep, this cost is too high. So I think it's really cool turn one saying here that you've actually said, you know what, I'm gonna go for it and I want my deck to be a tour around the beautiful land of homelands. And I think when, when we're looking at this deck and we're looking, okay, what is it supposed to do? Um, obviously it is mainly an artifact deck. You're playing with a lot of different colors. So artifacts are really important. And then you can see the other cards that he played are kind of on the right there, the colored spells. Uh, what he's done, there are almost no double colored spells. I think there are just a few that may cost a double blue or a double black, but most of them just require one single casting cost. Now, one of the things I really like here is he's playing with a card called Eternal Flame, and Eternal Flame is a card that does uh, X amount of damage to, uh, to your opponent, um, and that X amount is equal to the amount of, of mountains that you have. And you may think, why is he playing this card? Because he's not playing with any basic mountains. Well, he's playing with two Blood Moons on the main, which I think is just really cool. So he can play a Blood Moon, and what the Blood Moon does, right, it turns all his non-basics, so all his lands, into mountains. And then he plays Eternal Flame, and then he can do a lot of damage. I just think that's, <laughs> that's just the coolest 
the coolest ever like combo. It's very, um, you know, it's very unlikely that it happens a lot, but when it happens, it's it's a very cool thing. Uh, I, I'm also a big fan of uh, of the Rhino. Um, it's it's just it's such a cool card. It's it's a bit ridiculous. Uh, the Ebony Rhino I'm talking about. It's seven mana for a four five Trampler. So that is pretty steep. But hey, when it hits the board, you've got a 4-5 body, which is actually pretty big. And in this format, you know, Fallen Empire, Homelands, the Dark, a 4-5 creature with Trample is actually pretty powerful. And also he's combined that. He's also playing with Clockwork Gnomes. And I think Clockwork Gnomes could be kind of good in this deck. Uh, Clockwork Gnomes is a creature, 2-2 creature, and you can pay 3 and tap it. And then you can regenerate target artifact creature. So the Gnomes actually work quite well with a lot of cards in the deck. Now... Um, you know, I can I can talk a full episode just about this deck because there's so much to talk about, but I'm not going to do this because I also want to have a look at the actual match and show that match to you. And I also want to have a look at my own deck. So uh, this is the deck of turn one, Sengir. I think you've done a beautiful job. So my compliments to your deck building skills. And I'm really curious to see this deck in action. Um, if you want to take a closer look at this, uh, you can check the description below where you will find a link to the tournament page. And there you will also find uh, a link to this deck photo. And there will also be other deck photos there. So if you're interested in that, check the description below. Okay, this is the deck of turn one singer. Now we are going to take a look at my deck, Journey to the Wizard School. And here we see the deck that I am playing with today. I've called it Journey to the Wizard School because that's basically what it is. And you can also see that in the deck photo. So it all starts with that altered pirate ship on the left. It's got like a little treasure map on the altar made by a lady Death Touch, by the way, to celebrate the first year of Timmy Talks on Patreon. And as you can see, the idea is that a Timmy, a young Timmy goes on the ghost ship on the journey to the wizard school but before he can reach the wizard school there are a lot of dangers including a card here you see the german coast card that's actually a leviathan and a leviathan in german has a legends symbol on the card instead of a the dark symbol so maybe that's like fun for you to know it's a pretty cheap card to pick up so if you like that kind of stuff you can just you know get it uh, that's the reason i got four of them and i had to just play one of them in this deck um, another really nice thing maybe to know is when you look at the picture, you see the at the student dorms, you see two types of apprentice wizards. One of them is a little bit more darker. That's actually the exchange student. Uh, and I think it's a Japanese version of the apprentice wizard. So there are just a lot of like goofy and fun details that I've, um, that I've put in this deck photo and in this deck kind of to tell the story of the Timmy traveling to the wizard school. And you can also see next to the wizard school, you've got Reveka, who is of course the principal of the wizard school. And the wizard school is located on the floating islands. And if you kind of know the lore of homelands, you kind of know what that means, right? Baron Sengi really wants to get to the floating island and wants to attack the wizard school, but he simply can't find it, right? And so there are a lot of references to, to that story uh, that takes place in the homelands lore. Now, when we look at what the deck wants to do, because it's actually a deck that I thought about a lot as well, there are a few things that this deck want, wants to do. Now, the first thing is uh, it wants to kind of abuse Merchant Scroll. Now, there are three Merchant Scrolls in here, and with Merchant Scroll, I can look up a blue instant or interrupt. So what I've done is I've played with uh, the counter spells of Homelands, Memory Lapse, which I think is really a strong card one blue and one counter target spell right and that spell doesn't go to the bin doesn't go to the graveyard instead it goes on the top of the library now you may think okay it just goes to the top and he'll get to draw that card again but the thing is with memory lapse you're sh you're slowing down your opponent and that's exactly what i want to do this is a blue deck right it's a slow deck it's more a control deck i want to do stupid stuff so if i can um, kind of slow down my opponent that he cannot play his early game and I can drag the, uh, the, the match into late game, that's good news for me. Because in late game, what I want to do is I want to play an Amnesia, I want to play uh, my Deep Spawn, I want to play my Leviathan, and then I want to feed those creatures to my Humberit Spawning Bat. Now, Humberit Spawning Bat is a card I just really like because it's, it's I, I feel it's pretty good. It's too blue to cast for an enchantment. And you have to think we're playing Fallen Empire's uh, homelands and the dark in the in the wizard's cup so there is no enchantment removal right so once my hummered spawning bat is on the board it's safe it's not going anywhere so my hummered spawning bat i want to use that when i pay two blue and one i can sacrifice any blue creature i control so only blue creatures but i'm playing mono blue so that doesn't 
that doesn't mind you know that, that that's not a problem um, and when I sacrifice my creature, I get uh, an X amount of Kamarit tokens. Those are one one baby Hammerits. And um, that amount depends on the casting cost of your creature. So for example, if I have an apprentice wizard on, on the board, two blue and one to cast, if I would sack that to my Hammerit spawning bed, I would get three one one creatures because the casting cost of the apprentice wizard is three. So you can imagine if I'm succeed in sacrificing a leviathan or a deep spawn to my humber spawning bed i will get tons and tons of one one creatures and then you may think okay but they're one one you know who cares well there's a card in the dark called sunken city and sunken city gives all blue creatures plus one plus one so all of a sudden i have an army of two two creatures and you know apart from sacrificing a creature to the humber spawning bed on purpose you can also use it of course as a tool to uh, respond to your opponent. For example, my opponent plays a Fisher on one of my ghost ships, right? Fisher is a big problem for me because then I cannot regenerate my ghost ship. What I can do in response is use my Humbert spawning bed, pay two blue and one, sacrifice the ghost ship, and then my opponent loses the Fisher, I lose the ghost ship, but I also get four 1-1 one, one Kamarit tokens. So that's actually not a bad exchange, right? So in response of um, opponents trying to remove creatures, I can sacrifice them to my Humbert spawning bat. So that's actually uh, a pretty good deal for me. And just to get back to the Merchant Scrolls, because I feel I didn't really finish my story yet. So with Merchant Scroll, I can look up uh, Memory Lapse, but there are also some other cards. I've called them the Apprentice Tricks. So what I can do is I can look up High Tide, for example, one blue mana, and all my islands step for an extra blue. That can help me in certain circumstances to play an Amnesia out in turn four or to play a deep spawn or a leviathan out early and to kind of win the tempo game. Another card that's in this deck is Jinx. And Jinx is another card that I can look up with Merchant Scroll. And uh, Jinx is kind of this, this interesting card, I feel, because it's one blue and, and one. And what it does is kind of unique uh, in Homelands. It changes uh, a land type. So it can change any land type to whatever choice you make, to, base, to a basic land type, that is. So I can make an island into a plains, but I can also make Maze of If, which is restricted in this tournament, but everybody plays with one, I can turn a maze of if of my opponent into an island or a mountain or a forest, whatever, but I can take away the ability of the maze of if and then kind of create an opening for maybe an attack with a deep spawn or a leviathan. And the nice thing about Jinx is it's a cantrip, meaning I get to draw a card, not immediately, but I get to draw a card at the next turn's upkeep. So it replaces itself. Another really interesting card is a card called Chain Stasis, and Chain Stasis is uh, one blue to cast, and I get to untap or tap target creature, and the controller of that creature can pay one blue and two to um, untap or tap another creature. So I can use that in combination with, for example, Reveka. Reveka, I can tap it to deal two damage to any target. I can use my Chain Stasis to untap my Reveka and deal two damage again so then i can deal four damage in one turn or simply just untap my reveka so i can use it again uh at some other time you know because the drawback of reveka for people that don't know it's not a very well-known card of course it's two blue and two it's kind of a super timmy i can tap it and it can deal two damage to any target instead of one damage the problem is it then doesn't untap in the next turn's upkeep so it skips an untap step right so that is not kind of ideal uh, but with the chain stasis, I can kind of work around it. Um, now, just to go back to the Merchant Scroll again, another trick that I have with the Merchant Scroll is um, um, with the card Conchhorn. Now, Conchhorn is, is quite an interesting card. I believe it's spiked very recently. It's a card from Fallen Empires, two to cast and uh, one to sacrifice, one in sacrifice, and you get to draw two cards, put that in your hand, and then you have to choose a card from your hand and put that back on top of the library. Now, imagine... I've got too many lands, for example. I use my conch horn, I draw two cards, I put one of my lands on top of my library. If I can then after that, after I've done that, play a merchant scroll, I get to go through my deck, pick an instant or interrupt that I want, and then here it comes, I can shuffle my library again. So I'm basically shuffling away a card that I don't want, right? You may think this is kind of silly, but remember in a format like this, it's quite hard to draw into cards so having kind of a trick to draw cards and get rid of cards that you don't need, I think it's actually going to be quite valuable in this matchup. Okay, well, there's a lot more to say about my deck, but 
Um, I think we're kind of running <laughs> running over time and I really want to go to the match. So this is my deck. Uh, if you want to see other decks or if you want to know more about the rules of this tournament, as said before, check the description below. There you will find a link to the tournament website. And now we are going to go to the first match in this tournament. I'm excited. Okay, here we go. Game one. Game number one of the Wizard Cup. Here we go. On the left, we've got turn one, Sengir. And on the right, it is myself, Timmy. Uh, of course, with the Timmy playmat. And it looks like my opponent has taken a mulligan, going into six cards here, putting a card on the bottom of his library. And he's also on the play. And this, uh, this promises to be a very interesting tournament. Lots of cards that you don't see often, you know, Homelands card, Fallen Empire cards. And there's an island for me with a turn one play, a flood. Another card that you don't see that often, beautiful art, by the way, it's an enchantment. You can pay two blue to tap target non-flying creature. My opponent is playing one of the most expensive cards in Fallen Empires, the Rainbow Veil, vale, a very special land. And there's an AO pile from my side. And Rainbow Veil, vale, you can tap it for any color of mana, but there is a but. After that, you have to pass it on to an opponent. So you lose control after you've used it. And there's a wizard school from my side of the board. It looks like turn one Sengir has missed his land drop. That could turn out to be something problematic. Let's hope for my opponent that he can now find his land. It looks like he can't, he's just passing turn here. And I'm tapping for, there is Reveka, the 01 wizard dwarf, head of the wizard school making an appearance here. Ooh, my opponent has to discard. I think that's the tool belt there that he's discarding. A card from Homelands, you can make creatures unblockable with it, but in this case he has to discard. There's a Sunken City, that means my Reveka is now a 1-2 creature, getting a plus one, plus one pump from the Sunken City. So I can finally deal some damage here, and uh, turn one saying you're not doing too much yet, has to find some lands. And uh, yeah, this is good news for me, I guess, but I'd rather have a real match. Ooh, has to discard the gnomes, the 2-2 creature from Homelands that can regenerate artifact creatures. Things are not looking good for my opponent. And uh, paying the two blue, of course, for the upkeep cost of the Sunken City, playing another Sunken City. That means my Reveka is now 2-3, hitting for two, turn one saying you're going down to 17. And there's Rainbowville being used for a conch horn and Rainbowville, be, Rainbowville being passed over to me. And uh, that upside down card there, you see the magic card the back there uh, on Wizard School that actually represents Rainbowville. And I'm tapping my mana instantly as well to give the Rainbowville back. Of course, I didn't have to play out the Conch Horn, but I kind of felt that I wanted to give my opponent the mana back. It kind of um, felt good, you know, he was already low. And I believe this is, um, ooh, what is this card called again? I think the Anhava Township, one of those beautiful Homelands lands. Remember, my opponent, Turn 1 Singer, is playing with all five of them. So uh, that is pretty cool. Let's see if he can actually do something with them. And uh, we're both playing with Conch Horns on the board. By the way, Conch Horn is an artifact from Fallen Empires. Two to cast and uh, one to second use. And uh, for a moment, I thought he was going to use his Conch Horn. He's not. He's playing an AO pile. And uh, when you sacrifice and use it, you can draw two cards, put them in your hand. But um, after that, you have to put one card from your hand back on top of your library. So it's like it's like a little like mini mini Ancestral Recall, I guess. And there is another Fallen Empire lands. Unfortunately for my opponent, these lands come into play tapped. You can then untap them and you can sacrifice them. This is the black one, so you can sacrifice this for two black mana. And right next to that is actually the blue, the temple land. You can sacrifice it for two blue. So next turn, if he's willing to sacrifice his Fallen Empire lands, he's actually got a lot of mana uh, to his disposal. And the question is, what can he do with that mana? He's tapping at least the temple. Okay, he's going to crack the conch horn. There's a little glitcher on the line, it seems. We'll just have to wait and see. And now turn one Sengir is back. It looks like he's drawn two cards, put one of the cards from his hand back on top of the library. And remember, because of the double sunken city, my opponent is unable to use the AO pile against my Reveka. And that means I can deal even more damage. I've never seen a Reveka dealing so much damage like ever. So this is really an exception. Turn one Sengir being here on 11. It looks like there's another um, beautiful Homelands land making an appearance here, Ace and Abbey. 
And um, yeah, let's see if my uh, my opponent can actually play out a creature. He's playing with a lot of artifact creatures as well. So I wonder if he can play any. Tapping the Ace and Abbey. Tapping actually all his lands. That means that the Rainbowville is coming back to me. And oh, he's playing on one of those. It's a wall from the dark. Uh, I forgot the name, but he can... Uh, it has power equal or toughness equal to the amount of um, creatures. Uh, how does it work again? Okay, now actually turn one singer is demonstrating it to us. You can remove a creature from the graveyard and then you get plus one plus one counters on your wall. Now in response, I'm actually using my AO pile to kill the wall before he can do that. In this case, the gnomes had a casting cost of four. So that means that uh, the wall became an 05, I guess, because it's an 01 by itself. It's, uh, oh, I forgot the name of the wall, but you hardly ever see it. So it's really cool to kind of see it in play, but I use my AO pile to uh, destroy the wall. Sorry, sorry for that turn one Sangir. I just had to, because I want to keep attacking here with my Reveka. And you can see that my opponent is now on nine. I'm also not using my Rainbow Veil. And there is a Wizard School from Turn 1 Singer. So both players now have a Wizard School in play. That's pretty cool. And he's tapping four mana. Ooh, this is nice. I think it's a Clockwork Steed, isn't it? And oh, I'm playing a Memory Lapse. So he has to put it back on top of his library. That is pretty killing here for my opponent. That means next turn he's going to draw into the Clockwork Steed again. And look at this Amaze of If. And I'm after damage, I'm going to untap my Reveka with it. And uh, ooh, it's looking very bleak now for my opponent. He's on seven, tapping four again. There we see the Clockwork Steed, which is, I believe, a 4-4 creature. And uh, those four are plus one, plus oh counters. And I'm using the Conchorn here, end of turn of my opponent, drawing two, putting one back. And now drawing the one I put back. I'm still paying the four mana for the Sunken City casting cost, so that's pretty steep. Playing a temple of my own, you see that land that comes into play tapped. And what can I do here? I can of course attack and then it looks like I'm attacking. Not quite sure what I'm using the Rainbow Veil for. And oh, of course I'm tapping. I'm using my flood to tap down his Clockwork Steed. That's what I'm doing. Okay, it took me a moment to realize that. So I could swing in. Of course, Clockwork Steed not having flying means I can tap it down with the Flood. Uh, it does mean that my opponent, turn one singer, is getting the Rainbowville back. And let's see what he can do. I mean, there's just not so much. He really needs another blocker. Okay, okay, serrated arrows. That's actually pretty good. Comes into play with three arrowhead counters. He can tap and shoot a counter on my Reveka. And now he can also use his AO pile exactly to kill my Reveka. In response, I'm going to probably deal two damage here to turn one Sengir. But is he now stabilizing at the end? Remember, I also have that AO pile to put my opponent on one, but one is not dead. So he's attacking here for four. I have to take this damage. And remember, when he attacks every time, he loses a counter as well. So now the steed is a 3 4, I believe. Now he has to pass turn, and it looks like I'm not paying for one of the sunken cities, so that's being destroyed. Not paying the upkeep cost. Perhaps I have a ghost ship in hand that I can play out now. And exactly that's what's happening, the ghost ship. And remember, it's a 3-5 because of that sunken city, and I'm passing turn here. But that was kind of a nice move by my opponent with the serrated arrows in the AO pile, killing my Reveka. And that kind of at least buys him another turn. He needs an answer now for the flying ghost ship. Let's see if he can find one. He's got the lands at least that he needs. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank, of course, trying to think how can I, how can I survive one more turn so he can put in minus one, minus one counter on the ghost ship. I think that's what he's going to do, but then still the ghost ship is pretty big, right? So you can see me putting a counter on my ghost ship there. That's a minus one, minus one counter. So it's now a 2-4 again. So the boat is from the sunken city is gone, but it's going to be very difficult for my opponent. And um, decides to actually put a plus one, plus O counter back again on the steed. Does mean that the steed taps down. It looks like he's changing his mind here. 
deciding not to do it, going for another play, playing another steed. It's really nice to see these, by the way. Very cool cards. And he's passing turn, so I think I can now kill him. Yeah, attacking him for two, that means he's going to one. Then I can use the AO pile, and that's it. That's game number one. I kind of felt turn one saying here, you didn't get a fair shot in this game one because you simply didn't draw into any lands. And when you finally did, you were already too far behind. So I really hope that in our second game, you draw into some lands. And, and you also don't have to take that mulligan because don't forget that my opponent also started with a mulligan. But what an interesting and beautiful deck you've brought to this tournament. So uh, we'll give these players some time to sideboard and then we'll catch back up with this match in game number two. Game number two, and uh, we're ready. Let's hope that my opponent, turn one singer, can find his lands. And uh, oh, it looks like the tables have turned a little bit. I'm taking a mulligan here. Remember, in game one, my opponent had to take a mulligan. Uh, I am on the draw, so that's uh, that's uh, not too bad when you take a mull when you're on the draw. At least you can uh, can draw a card there. Uh, playing a basic island, my opponent here has played a temple followed by a wizard school. So it looks like he's finding his lands and. The nice thing here is that both of our decks are kind of laid back, they're chilled, like turn one, eh, I'm not really going to do anything, turn two, let's see what time it is, turn three, maybe we can do something. So we kind of have the same attitude, which is quite nice, and we see turn one saying you're playing one of those beautiful Homelands lands, is second already, I think this one is the Cuscan Keep, and I'm playing out another island, tapping both, am I going to play an Aopile, Conchhorn, okay, a Merchant Scroll, one blue and one, and a merchant scroll lets me choose a blue instant or interrupt, and I have to show that to my opponent, and then I can put it into my hand, and afterwards I have to shuffle my library again. It looks like I'm choosing um, to go for a memory lapse, the counter spell from Homelands, and uh, when you use it to counter a spell, that spell doesn't go to the graveyard, it goes to the top of the library of the opponent, so it's a really good delay spell, although I think against this deck I don't really need that much delay. Um, so looking it up, passing turn here, there, I believe that's an Ace and Abbey that turn one singer has played, and there is a Clockwork Steed, so this is a 4-3 creature, and his power are actually 4 plus 1 plus 0 oh counters, you can see him here putting the dice on the horse, and when he attacks he loses a counter, or blocks for that matter. And then during his upkeep, I believe he can put a counter back on the steed. Oh, and this is a card we haven't seen in game number one. The Giant Oyster, summon Oyster, two blue and two to cast for an O3. Actually a pretty good creature in this format because what can it do when your opponent attacks with the creature? Um, and you can actually use the Oyster to keep that creature tapped, right? So it keeps a creature tapped and in every upkeep you can put a minus one minus O counter on there. But let's look at what turn one Singer is doing. Sacrificing his temple using five mana to cast a Coal Golem from the dark. And this is a 3-3 three, three creature and you can pay three and sack it to gain three red mana. And look at him attack here, dealing four damage. I'm going to go down to 16 and then he's using his Maze of If to tap this creature down and that is a great strategy because that means that I cannot use my um, giant oyster to actually keep the steed tapped because he's using his mace to untap it, basically giving it vigilance. So that means that my giant oyster is not really doing anything at the moment. And uh, what can I do here? So there is some pressure right now on the board. and. Okay, it looks like I'm drawing a card for a moment there. I thought it was just passing turn, but I'm not doing that. Finding another island, tapping four. Well, we see a ghost ship. Okay, there's a ghost ship again. Playing with four of these ghost ships, and they, of course, are very powerful. And remember, I've still got the memory lapse, and I can actually use it because the temple, I can sacrifice it for two blue to counter something if need be. I don't think that I will do that quickly because mana are pretty important for my deck. My deck needs a lot of mana to do what I want to do. And let's see what turn one singer is going to do here. Probably going to look for land. He's actually not doing anything, just passing turn here, realizing that it doesn't make any sense to attack because of that ghost ship and the giant oyster. That means that I'm going to attack. He's not using the maze. Okay, that's very interesting. He's going to go down to 18. Maybe he forgot. Maybe he has a reason playing another ghost ship. And when you look closely, you see that I'm keeping my temple untapped. Why? I could sacrifice my temple and pay one blue to regenerate one of my ghost ships if I have to. And now during his upkeep, he's using the ability of the Clockwork Steed. You can tap it and you can refill the counters again. So you can like rewind it 
basically. So now it's a 4-3. Of course, the downside is that it is now tapped. So that means that I can use my giant oyster to keep it tapped next turn. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, if I'm actually going to do that. Okay, so now we're back. There were some connection issues, but I'm really curious to see, am I going to use my giant oyster here? So first my opponent is going to draw. Okay, there we see one of those uh, Ornithopters from Homelands. This one is one mana to cast. I believe it's an, uh, it's an O2 flyer, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you can actually uh, pump it for two mana. You can make it plus one plus O, and you cannot do that more than twice. And I'm using my Giant Oyster here to keep the Clockwork Steed tapped. And you can already see um, that there's a counter being placed on the Clockwork Steed, and that's actually uh, a minus one, minus one counter. And this is pretty horrible for uh, for turn one saying you're finding a sunken city. That means that my ghost ships all of a sudden turn into three, five flyers. And now he is using his Mace of If this time, turning back one of my ghost ships, still taking three damage, gonna drop to 15, finding a rainbow veil here. So things are looking very good for me again. And, uh, and really because of uh, those ghost ships. Ghost ships in this format are incredibly strong, especially when you play mono, blue you know it's very hard to get rid of them with those uh, three blue regeneration options and of course the uh, the four toughness is it, pretty strong in this format and tapping for gaining control of the rainbow veil now and my opponent is playing another um clockwork uh beast it's not the clockwork steed but it's another one but i use my um my memory lapse here to send it back to the top of my opponent's library. And I kind of have to look up what the name of that card is. And yeah, Clockwork Swarm. It's a beautiful art by Amy Weber, by the way. And it's my turn attacking, of course, with both of my ghost ships. And another minus one, minus one counter on the Clockwork Steed. And look at that, he's taking the damage. It's quite interesting. Choosing not to use the Mace of If. I'm a little bit surprised here. Going down to nine, does he have a plan with his Maze of If? He's actually going to pump up his creatures. He's going to deal four damage to me. That means I'm on 12 right now. But that seems to be it. Another counter on the Clockwork Steed. That means that it's dead now. So untap, and then I keep my Oyster tapped. And in the upkeep, there's a minus one, minus one counter on the creature that it's, it's tapping. And playing another... Merchant Scroll, so I'm probably going to go for, oh, I'm going to go for Chain Stasis. That means that I can now untap my Giant Oyster, and then I can keep one of those creatures of my opponent tapped. So this is kind of like a little combo that I've got going on in my deck. So Chain Stasis is a card for one blue. You can tap or untap target creature, and uh, the controller of that creature can then pay one blue and two to do that effect again. So that's why it's called a chain stasis. First, I'm going to attack here with both of my ships. He's going to send one back, dealing three damage. He's going to drop to six. Using the chain stasis, going to untap my oyster. Now I'm going to use my oyster, and I think I'll probably go for the flyer because I want to be the king in the air, right? So I'm probably going to go for the, uh, for the thopter here. It's an O2 creature, so that means that it'll take me two turns to kill the Thopter. And in the meanwhile, my Oyster will keep the Thopter tapped. So that's actually pretty good news. Yeah, it's the Thopter, so only the Golem is untapping here. Beautiful art by Chris Rush, by the way. There we see another one of those uh, Fallen Empire Sacklands that come into play tapped. This one is the Black Edition and a pass turn. And yeah, things are looking very bad for my opponent. There's, of course, again, a minus one, minus one counter on the Thopter. It's not being placed there yet, but it is there. And I'm probably going to attack. Yeah, here now I mention it. And I'm going to attack. So the Thopter is not able to block here because it remains tapped. And there we see turn one saying you're going to three life. It looks like I've got this game number two. He needs a miracle. Okay, he's playing a Thopter. Actually, oh, of course, I still had... Or did I have? No, I had a I have a memory lapse in hand here. This is the other one, not the one I looked up with the Merchant Scroll. But this is enough to win the game because that means he cannot block my other ghost ship. And he only has one maze on the field. So only one ability to stop one of my ghost ships. So that means this is now 0-2. Now, the nice thing of this tournament is that every game counts. You get one point for a game. So it's not like you win points for winning a match. No, you got to win a game. Each game one is a point. So... 
if I win this uh, 0-3, I've earned three points. But if my opponent maybe wins a game, he still ends up with the points. So this final game also matters here in the Wizards Cup tournament. So let's quickly go to game three and see how this ends. Game number three, here we go. So can my opponent steal the final game and at least get a point from this first uh, ever match here in the Wizards Cup tournament? And showing him my hand and taking a mulligan. So at least that is a good start for my opponent, me taking a mulligan. I also did that in game number two. Didn't help turn one singular much though. But uh, I think in game two, it was more of a game than in game one. So that was good to see. I think Clockwork Steve, Clockwork Swarm. I think those cards are actually pretty good because for four mana, you get, you get four power. That's not too bad. I think the air is, is, is one of the problems here for my opponent where I have, of course, ghost ships. Uh, they're difficult to stop. And uh, putting a card there on the bottom of my library here, game number three, turn one Sengir again on the play, finding one of those temples. It's actually pretty good. Like if you don't have a turn one play anyway, it's it, it's a good way to start the game. I'm doing the same thing here. And there is the Anhava Inn. Or is it called Anhava Township? Yeah, it's called Anhava Township. Anhava Inn is another card. In homelands playing a basic island here passing turn so again the slow start of both of these decks very laid back there we see the ace and abbey and um yeah the uh, the ace and decks i'm actually expecting quite a lot of them because you can make a pretty sweet blue white flyers deck with uh with homelands in combination with um with the dark and fallen empires there is another blue land Three mana and just passing turn here. So let's see what turn one Sengir can do. And playing the Cuscan Keep. How cool would it be if he can he's able to cast all five homelands lands in one single game? That would have been pretty sweet. I'm expecting a clockwork steed here. Oh, interesting. He's playing a blood moon. That means that all his lands are now mountains, and my temple is also a mountain. This is pretty interesting that Maze also a mountain. At least I can use it for mana. Tapping four to cast a ghost ship. And that is a really interesting move here by my opponent. Because remember, he, he's the one playing with five colors. Although most of the, um, the cards that he plays are artifacts. Tapping five here. What are we going to get? Oh, this is an interesting card. It's a 2-2 creature. What is it called again? It can prevent all the damage that you get from flying creatures for paying six. It's, uh, it's a Scarecrow, of course, 2-2 two, two Scarecrow, six and tap, and you can prevent all the damage dealt to you by flying creatures. But, I mean, it's not going to help him much now because he doesn't have enough mana. So I'm just expecting an attack here uh, from my side being able to deal two damage. Or am I going to keep it untapped to possibly block it if he wants to attack? I think the best thing here exactly is just to swing in. So we see turn one singer dropping here to 18 and paying two more for a Hammerid Spawning Bat. So Hammerid Spawning Bat enchantment from Fallen Empires. And what it does is you can play pay two blue and, and one to sacrifice a blue creature and you get one one Kamarid tokens uh, equal to the amount of the casting cost of the blue creature. So for example, if I would sack the ghost ship, I would get four Kamarid tokens. Okay, there we see a Thopter by my opponent, the O2 creature, uh, flying creature for one. And what else can he do? We're also playing a coal golem, the 2-2 two -two creature, uh, I believe, for five. And attacking here for two. So he's actually playing out a lot of creatures, putting some pressure on my life total here. Going down to 18, finding an island. And what can I do? Okay, showing him my Kamadit uh, token. It's a token from 1996. If you actually want to know more about tokens in the history, I've got a, a movie about these tokens. I believe they're from Star City Games, and I've got that on my uh, on my YouTube channel here on Timmy Talks. I'll post a link in the description below. There we see Reveka, the Wizard Savant. And it's a signed Reveka, by the way. And uh, it's an 0-1 creature. We've seen it before in this matchup. 
and it can actually you know do some damage here it can take out the scarecrow it can take out the thopter it's uh yeah it could be a problem here for my oppo opponent so he probably wants to do something against it Ooh, and this is a very good card here from fallen empires a card that can actually win you a game this is ring of renewal five to cast five to use and then you need to do five and tap you get to draw two cards and then you have to discard a card but the, the cool thing about this ring is that if you have no cards in hand you actually don't have to discard a card oh yeah and this discarding goes at random attacking here with the coal golem and the thopter interesting choice here i wonder what he's going to do okay changing his mind actually i thought maybe he's got some kind of weird combo trick up his sleeve but changing his mind last minute deciding not to attack so i'm untapping meaning my reveka no longer has summoning sickness i can tap it to deal two damage to any target so i can take out some creatures on the other side of the board if i want to first attacking here with my ghost ship and we see turn one saying you're taking the damage dropping here to 16 and using reveka here to shoot down the thopter and playing a chain stasis on it so i can untap it using chain stasis again to also untap my ghost ship here so that is some cool tech and that means i can use reveka again if i want to And this is exactly what I want to do with the Chain Stasis. Chain Stasis also works great against, for example, a Bull Lightning. Really, really good card to take that out as well. And passing turn here to my opponent, untapping his lance. And uh, showing here the signature, it seems. But more importantly here is what is my opponent going to do? He can, of course, use that Ring of Renewal to try to draw into some cards. I mean, he's still on 16. That's not too bad. He has to kind of get rid. Yeah, he's using the Ring. So now he has to discard at random. So I'm going to pick one of his cards. And he's going to discard, I believe, is that a Brainwash? Is it called a Brainwash? One white to cast. And then... Um, my opponent, or, or the, the, you can put it on the creature, and then the creature will has, has to pay, I believe, three if it wants to attack. It's kind of this weird, weird card from the dark. You don't see it often. Using Reveka here on the end step of my opponent to kill the Scarecrow. Attacking here for two, that means that turn one thing, you're dropping here to 14. And playing a Merchant Scroll, probably going to look up a Memory Lapse exactly. And that's just really annoying for your opponent. Your opponent kind of knows, okay, if I'm going to play out something big, it's going to get memory lapse. I'm just going to draw into it again. It's kind of annoying. And that's probably what's going to happen. You're playing the Clockwork Steed. Yeah, there we see the memory lapse. And, oh, he's playing, uh, he's, this, is, um, this is the sword. Um, it's kind of like an equip card from Fallen Empires. You can pay some mana and tap it, and you can give target creature plus two plus O, oh, the Zelon Sword, I believe it's called. It's a pretty cool card. It's also on the reserve list. Really nice art. Ooh, Amnesia in my turn. And, ooh, look at that. He has to discard Broken Visage. Broken Visage, actually a very good card. The problem, of course, for my opponent here is basically his own blood moon his own blood moon making it really hard to play out these cards so that maybe was not the best decision on the other hand you know it is part of his strategy with eternal flame to play out that uh blood moon and now he plays out the clockwork steed 4-3 creature attacking with the golem blocking the golem here and he's using the sword that means that i have to regenerate my ghost ship and then I can kill it with Ruveka. And um, my opponent playing a little bit of all or nothing here because he knows he's behind again. He's now on 14. Probably going to swing in again. Actually deciding not to. Probably because of that pretty big Clockwork Steed. Another Clockwork Steed. There's actually a lot of pressure playing a Memory Lapse here again. Clockwork Steed going back to the top of the library of Turn 1 Sengir and putting the sword on attacking now with a 6-4 that's huge blocking again and unfortunately for me Reveka was tapped so I couldn't use Reveka to kill the clockwork steed 
and drawing into a card, just one card in hand. My opponent, of course, having that ring. So he's still very much in the game and deciding not to attack again. And there is another Clockwork Steed. I wonder now if Turn 1 Singer is choosing to attack or not. I mean, those Clockwork Steeds are putting some pressure on the board. And remember, because of the Zeon Sword, the Clockwork Steed is now a 5-3. So what he can do is attack, but then he'll just lose the Steed because it can block it on the Ghost Ship and then use my Reveka to kill the Steed. So I don't think that he's going to do that. Then again, you never know. And I'm using the Reveka to deal two damage here to my opponent, it seems. So it means he's gonna go to 12. And because I'm doing that, I'm kind of opening up the door now. There is a Conchorn using the Conchorn straight away. I'm kind of opening up the door now for my opponent to attack with both the Clockwork Steeds. So I'm not sure if that's the best decision. Ooh, also attacking here with my Ghost Ship, okay. It looks like I just want to kind of finish the game here. I have played out that Apprentice Wizard. Now remember, I can sack um, the Apprentice Wizard also to my uh, my Hummer at Spawning Bat to get uh, three one one Kamadit tokens. And there we see Turn One Singer using his Ring of Renewal, drawing into two cards, losing the Fasten. Really nice art from the dark that one. And now of course he's going to attack with Clockwork Steed, both of them, one being a five three and one being a 4-3. I'm kind of expecting exactly, I'm sacking my Apprentice Wizard to my Hummer at Spawning Bat, creating three 1-1 one -one Cumber Tokens, probably gonna block two of them to just chump block the attacking Clockwork Steeds, not taking any damage here and having a 1-1 one -one, uh, Cumber still after, after those blocks. So that is actually not too bad for me. I wonder what I'm gonna do here. Am I gonna attack and deal two damage to him? That means he would drop to six. I wonder if that's going to be the strategy. Finding another like creature would be ideal, of course. And look at that, deciding to attack with both, dealing three damage, he's gonna drop to seven. Wow, I wonder what I'm gonna do here. He's choosing to, is he, oh, he's just, putting new counters on them, choosing to keep them tapped. I feel very lucky. I kind of expected him to untap and attack here. The way the clockworks, these clockwork creatures work, it's, it's just like the, the, the other clockwork creatures, right? Like clockwork avian and stuff, um, is that in your upkeep, you can choose to tap them and kind of refill, uh, rewind them and, and refill the counters on them. Ooh, this is interesting. This is an interesting card against serrated arrows. And he's using the Serrated Arrows to kill my Reveka. And of course, in response, I'm going to deal two damage and then I'm going to sack it to the Hummer at Spawning Bad. That means I'm going to get four Kamarit tokens. Already had one, so now I've got five 1-1 one, one Kamarit tokens. And that's why that Hummer at Spawning Bad is so strong. Because in response to that play for my opponent, I can end deal two damage with the Reveka and I can make four 1-1 one, one creatures. And that's kind of killing my opponent right now. Look at his life total, already dropped to five. I can attack him here for seven, and that's probably going to be game here. And uh, that means an 0-3 victory. Yeah, there just wasn't much you could do. The Gnome's actually a pretty good card. I think from all the games we played, this game number uh, three was the most fun by far. And how cool is it to see these cards in action? Cards you never see, you know, Clockwork Gnomes, Clockwork Steed. <laughs> I mean, Clockwork, Clockworks everywhere. Uh, but also Reveka, Wizard Savant, uh, you know, the Hummerich Spawning Bat, all those beautiful homelands lands like Koskin Keep and Aeson Abbey. And it's just, I just love the flavor. These were the sets, uh, you know, that I played with when I just started. And I remember trying to find a good card in homelands and that actually wasn't easy. So it's really nice to kind of see them having a purpose in this Wizards Cup tournament. Let me know what you think about this tournament, about the setup in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. Also, if you have ideas of new tournaments or other tournaments or cards you'd like to see, let me know in the comments below. And maybe, who knows, maybe the next tournament will have your favorite set in it. Of course, it has to be old school, whatever that means, right? Um, well, thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. And if you want to follow more of this tournament, uh, catch back up with me uh, next week because then I will be posting another uh, match played in the Wizards Cup 
It's not going to be um, a match where I play in. It's going to be two other players with two completely different decks. Um, so if you're looking forward to that, keep an eye on the channel. That will be next week, Tuesday. Talking about the channel, it would be great if you could help me out. How can you do that? It's super simple. All you have to do is click that like button, that thumbs up button. That really helps a lot. Also, leave a positive comment, you know, spread the positivity on the internet. You know, we can really use it. And you can also become a subscriber. If you're not a sub yet of Timmy Talks, you would help me uh, and you would help the channel out by just becoming a sub. It's completely free, so why not do it? Just click that subscriber button. Thank you in advance for doing that. And uh, what you can also do is you can become a sponsor of the show by becoming a patron via Patreon. There's probably a card popping up right now. And if you do, you can actually join crazy loony tournaments like this. You can also uh, join our Discord server and there are all sorts of other perks and, uh, and things that you get when you uh, join the Timmy Talks train on Patreon. So what are you waiting for? Click on that info card and check out Timmy Talks on Patreon. Talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at our fantastic, amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. So let's go. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee.